my name is Anna Pielach, uh, and uh, I have the great pleasure of introducing our speaker today, um, Professor Dave Golson. Uh, he's a professor of uh, biology at University of Sussex, and he specializes in um, bee ecology, especially bumblebees. He has published over 300 scientific publications, uh, which are mo many of which are very highly cited by other scientists. Uh, but what's also really nice is that he reaches out to the general public publishing uh, books that uh, tell us, for example, what we can do in our garden to avert the crisis uh, affecting insects and biodiversity in general. And one of, so he has published uh, seven books now, and his most recent one is Silent Earth, Averting the uh, Insect Apocalypse. And um, th this was uh, last year, and this was um, one of the reasons we have invited Dave to talk here, because this is, um, this is a really good uh, excuse to take up the topic again. And of course, uh, his profile fits very well into this larger event. Um, so with that, I would like to give word to Dave. Dave is just recovering from COVID, so um, please be gentle in case, he, if he, in case he struggles a little bit with his throat. He might need a bit of a break. Okay, thank you, Anna, for introducing me. Um, it's a pleasure to, to be here today to talk about insects. Kind of my favourite subject. I've been um, fascinated by insects all, all my life. Um, it's it's start, difficult to know where to start. There's so much I could tell you. There are so many different types of insect. Uh, more than a million species have so far been named. And um, I, scientists estimate there could be another three or four million species of insect that we haven't discovered yet on our planet, which I always think is an amazing statistic. Anyway, so I thought I'd start at the beginning. Uh, why not? Um, with where insects came from. Um, so, so insects are, were pretty much the first land animals on planet Earth. Um, they crawled out of the the oceans about 480 million years ago, which is a really long time. It's mind boggling. You can't really get your head around it. Um, uh, it's much, much uh, longer ago, for example, than the dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Um, and insects were very successful and remain very successful to this day. And in fact, arguably, this is the planet of the insects. They make up the majority of life forms, both in terms of numbers of species and numbers of individuals. Even just ants, one type of insect, outnumber us humans by about a million to one. It's, it's roughly estimated. Um, so they speciated in this early world um, and lots of new types of insect appeared. Um, back then, oxygen concentrations were much higher than they are today. Um, uh, and that allowed insects to grow bigger um, uh, I, and some of the early insects that were dragonfly-like creatures with a wingspan of um, about 80 centimeters. Must have been amazing creatures, um, hard to imagine. Of course, the insects were the first creatures to fly on our planet and they had the skies to themselves for uh, about 160 million years until the, the pterosaurs came along. Um, so, as I say, they've evolved into an incredible diversity of shapes and colours and sizes and so on. And I thought I'd start, start out by just um, very gently having a look at some pictures of some nice insects. So nothing very, nothing very challenging to begin with here today. Um, so I'm just going to run through some of my favourites, but there are so many I could have shown you. Um, this is a weevil, a type of beetle. Weevils are a kind of subset of the beetle family. Um, you know, there are, there are no less than 97,000 species of weevil on our planet. Uh, these funny little beetles, they all have a little kind of curvy snout, uh, rather endearing, I think. Uh, some insects are beautifully camouflaged um, uh, to try and avoid being eaten by a larger predator. So this is a type of cricket that's doing a pretty good impression of a leaf. Um, there are insects that pretend to be flowers. This is a, an orchid mantis that uh, um, it's, it's got a, a butterfly's wing in its, in its uh, legs. It's just finished eating the poor creature. Uh, it mimics a flower, this insect, which um, attracts pollinating insects. They think it's, it's, they may get some nectar or pollen and they end up getting eaten instead. 
There are insects that pretend to be other insects. Um, uh, this is a, an example of mimicry. Um, this is a fly, a completely harmless fly with no sting. Um, it's evolved to pretend to be a bumblebee. Uh, it's a pretty convincing mimic. I, most humans are fooled by, by this. And of course it does it again to avoid being, being eaten. If birds think it may have a sting, they're less likely to try and eat it. Some insects are extraordinarily colorful um, absolutely stunning uh, creatures. These insects are all ones that are advertising that they're poisonous um, with these bright colours, so they don't bother trying to be camouflaged, they instead um, uh, make it very clear that if anything tries to eat them they'll be poisoned. And then there are insects that are just plain weird and we have no idea why they look like they do. Um, this is a funny little frog hopper from Central America which exudes little um, strands of, of coloured wax from its bottom. Um, it looks a bit like an optic fibre. Um, nobody knows why. Uh, the, nobody has yet come up with an explanation as to what purpose this serves. It must be doing something. It looks like quite an encumbrance, um, but uh, maybe one day we'll find out. There's even uh, an insect, a, a type of shield bug in uh, Asia, which um, seems to be doing an impression of Elvis, although I'm sure that's not deliberate. Anyway, um, I, my point is that insects are incredibly diverse. Um, my speciality um, are, are, as Anna mentioned at the beginning, are bees. Um, bees were a relatively late comers to the insect party. Um, Bees have uh, been around a mere 120 million years, uh, which still means they appeared before things like Tyrannosaurus rex um, evolved. Um, but obviously compared to 480 million years ago when the first insects appeared, it's comparatively late. And this, this is one of the earliest known insects right here, um, trapped in amber tree resin and fossilized. And I always think it's just amazing that you can look at an insect that was flying around 120 million years ago in the world ruled by dinosaurs um, before they were wiped out, which was 65 million years ago. Um, bees evolved from wasps. They're, if you like, bees are, are vegan wasps. They, um, their ancestor would have been a solitary wasp. Um, lived on its own and the female wasp would have made a little burrow in the ground and stocked it with paralyzed um, prey items, might have been spiders or caterpillars or something, and laid her eggs on those. But the ancestor of the bees started using pollen instead of paralyzed insects as prey and that was the first bee and, and this too has proved to be a pretty successful life cycle. There are 25,000 species of bee known in the world um, and again, they come in, in a, a somewhat bewildering array of shapes and sizes, some absolutely stunning creatures here. Um, bottom left is one I'd love to see, just to pick one out at random. I've not seen that myself. It's the, the, the cobalt carpenter bee, um, which uh, lives in China. Uh, worth a trip to China just to see one of those, surely. Um, anyway, let me just un rewind a bit. Um, go back to how I first got interested in, in insects. Um, so actually, I don't really know why, but when I was only five or six years old, I developed this sort of passion for creepy crawlies, for insects, for bugs. And I like to capture them and keep them in cages and jam jars and, and so on, uh, and rear them up and, and um, watch them, in some cases, turn from caterpillars into butterflies. And I just thought it was magical. And uh, um, I, I've been very privileged to manage to make a career out of chasing around after, after insects. Um, this, is, this isn't me, uh, uh, fairly obviously. This is my youngest son, actually, Seth, who's uh, 11 now. Uh, this was taken a couple of years ago. There he is with his pet cockchafer. Colin, his name was, the cockchafer. Um, sadly, no longer with us. But Seth, Seth is in a bug phase, uh, like I went through. Um, and I hope, like me, he doesn't ever grow out of it. Um, but the sad truth is that most people do. A lot, I think lots of little kids, given half a chance, have an enthusiastic bug phase. But by the time they're teenagers or adults, their reaction to anything that buzzes near them is, is more likely to be one of um, 
of fright of, of the, they flap around they try to kill it they think it's going to sting them bite them do something to them um, which is ridiculous really because most insects have no intention of doing us any harm at all um, so my my mission in life these days is to try and persuade people to love insects um, or if that's perhaps um, going too far for most people to at least respect them because as we'll see in a little while insects are incredibly important um, and they're in trouble insects are in decline um, so I'm afraid there's a little bit of a, a, a some parts of this talk are a bit depressing but bear with me um, so I should say that, that for most insect groups we don't have good data um, nobody is um, nobody's counting most insects in the world. Um, it's, 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 there's so many of them. Um, it's quite a daunting task and many of them are hard to identify. Um, uh, so we, we actually have no long-term data on insect populations for anywhere in the tropics, uh, which is really quite worrying because obviously that's where most insects live. But in, in Europe and North America, there are some long running insect monitoring schemes tend to be focused on big and beautiful insects like butterflies here. Um, so this just shows you uh, one such scheme from the UK where we, we monitor insects quite carefully and have done since 1976. And you can see they've, they've declined. They've been split here into the sort of more common butterflies at the top and the, the fussy specialist butterflies at the bottom. Um, but as you can see, both groups um, have, have declined since 1976. Overall, um, butterfly numbers in the UK are estimated to have fallen by about 50% since 1976. Um, now just by pure coincidence, my I mentioned my son Seth is 11 now. Well, in 1976, when these data started, I was 11, um, same age as he is now. So, He's growing up in a world where there are half as many butterflies as the world I grew up in. Um, and that, that seems really sad and, and obviously um, also raises the, the issue, you know, what, will, um, what will his children um, uh, think, think is normal? How many butterflies will they see? It isn't just butterflies that we have data for. Um, we have um, various other data sets from different countries and one of the best known um, is this one. Um, this is from a German study um, conducted by keen insect enthusiasts using um, malaise traps. The top right there, that's a malaise trap, named after René Malaise, a, a Swedish um, uh, scientist uh, from the 17 or 1800s, I think. Um, anyway, the, the malaise trap catches flying insects of all types. Um, and these, these uh, German insect uh, folk have been putting malaise traps on na uh, German nature reserves since the late 1980s. And what the chart shows you is how the, the average weight uh, of insects caught per day per trap has changed from 1989 to 2016. Um, and you can see pretty clearly that it fell. Um, on average, it fell by 76%. So, seemingly three quarters of, of the flying insects have disappeared from German nature reserves in just 26 years, which is it's pretty terrifying. Um, when this was published in 2017, it got a lot of media attention around the world. And I think it was a little bit of a turning point when, when the appreciation that insects were in trouble became much more widespread than it, than it had been. So insects are declining. Why, why does that matter? Well, um, it really does matter. Uh, it, it was I, I put quite summed up quite nicely by a bit of a hero of mine, E.O. Wilson, who's an American biologist who died just a few months ago. I mean, well into his 90s. Um, amazing guy, the world's expert on ants, um, amongst other things. I won't read his whole quote here. It's, you may well have heard it before, but he basically said, that if people were to somehow disappear from the planet, it would do pretty nicely without us. Um, but if insects were to vanish, the, in, the environment would collapse into chaos, was how he put it. Uh, now, why did he say that? Uh, it seems like quite a dramatic claim. 
uh, well. Um, firstly, uh, insects make up the bulk of life on Earth, as I've already said. They are a big chunk of biodiversity, if we're concerned about that. Um, but then they're food for a very large number of the other creatures that aren't insects, things like birds, um, like these beautiful bee eaters. Uh, many other birds eat insects, as do bats and freshwater fish and amphibians and reptiles and so on. They all depend upon um, uh, insects for, uh, for food. And if the insects disappear, then obviously the, 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 the birds and other creatures will, will go too. Um, but insects aren't just important as, as food. Uh, they're important in many other ways. Uh, they help to control pest numbers in crops. They're biocontrol agents. They're also obviously often the pests themselves, so not all insects are particularly helpful. Um, uh, they're, they're recyclers of dung and dead bodies and trees and leaves and all sorts of other things, which is a really important process. Not glamorous, that the life of a dung beetle is far from glamorous, but we need them uh, to recycle all the nutrients trapped in cowpats and other forms of dung. Uh, they help to keep the soil healthy, they distribute seeds, they do all sorts of really important stuff uh, that we need something to do. Um, and most of this isn't really appreciated by anyone, but uh, the one thing I think that is appreciated by uh, the majority of people is pollination. Um, uh, the large majority of the world's wildflowers need pollinating by some kind of animal, um, usually an insect. In the tropics it may be a bird. Um, I should stress that pollination is not all done by, um, uh, by bees, it's done by uh, bees and butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, beetles and so on. Thousands of species of insect pollinate and they ensure that wildflowers set seed and continue and of course they ensure that our uh, supermarket shelves remain full of goodies. Um, we've become used to uh, our shops being full of this amazing array of fruit and veg, but if we didn't have um, insect pollinators, then things wouldn't look so so good. Um, we wouldn't have um, apples, cherries, um, squashes, tomatoes, chili peppers. Um, three quarters of the crops we grow in the world depend upon insect pollination. Even coffee and chocolate depend upon insect pollination. So we really do need to look after them. Now, I've trotted this argument out many times that we, we should look after um, insects because they're important to us. Um, we would starve without them and so on. And it's true, but I always find it's a, a bit unsatisfying. It's a very selfish way of looking at, at the insect world, just conserving them because that we benefit from them. Um, and actually, it worries me that there are probably insects that we don't benefit from that um, could go extinct. And, um, uh, and it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, so we can't justify conserving everything on the grounds of what it does for us. Um, so here's an example. Uh, here's an insect, um, the, the St. Helena giant earwig, um, which lived on St. Helena, which is a tiny island in the South Atlantic. Um, it's extinct. It went extinct in the 1960s. Um, uh, probably eaten by rats that we accidentally introduced to the island, uh, which is very sad, um, poor earwigs. But there was no kind of ecological catastrophe when they went extinct. It seemed they didn't do anything vitally important. But it seems to me the world is a sadder place for their loss, even if we didn't need them. Um, and uh, put it another way, you know, just because we, we have the ability to wipe out life on Earth, um, it surely doesn't give us the right to do so. And I would argue that all species, whether they're useful to us or not, have a right to life. Okay, so if we're going to look after insects better than we have, we need to understand why they've declined. Um, there are lots of drivers of insect decline, and I haven't got time to, to, to go into them at length here. Um, uh, but just bear in mind that there are many of them. I'll say a tiny bit more about, about uh, the first two here, loss of habitat and pesticides. So, um, an increasingly large proportion of the surface of the earth looks like this. Um, Industrialised monoculture farming um, has displaced whatever natural habitats used to occur around the world. 
Um, so this is a picture I took off the internet. It could be from anywhere. Um, I think it's from South America. But before we came along, there would have been forests or perhaps grassland or scrub. There would have been butterflies and bees and birds and mammals and so on. A whole community which was scraped away and replaced with, with, with this. Um, and of course we need to feed people, but if we do it this way, it has very big negative consequences for, for biodiversity fairly clearly. Um, now associated with this type of farming um, uh, is very heavy inputs of, of chemicals, fertilizers and pesticides. And uh, pesticides in particular quite clearly impact on insects because many of the pesticides applied are designed to kill insects. They are insecticides. Um, so this is a familiar site in, in Europe, a tractor spraying pesticide onto a crop. We're actually quite lucky in Europe that our pesticide use by farmers is regulated better than it is in, in many countries. Um, in other parts of the world, it's common to see this kind of thing, um, dumping pesticides from aeroplanes, which is obviously very indiscriminate. Um, uh, and in the developing world, there's really no regulation of pesticide use at all. I took this picture in um, uh, just outside Calcutta three years ago. Um, it's a guy, a little uh, a, a farmer, he has about two acres of land and he grows fruits and vegetables and he carries them on his bicycle into the market in the city and sells them, which is all sounds very sustainable. Um, zero packaging, minimal food miles and so on. Um, but what's he doing here? So he's spraying a pesticide using some really ancient spray equipment. Um, he has no training in, in, in spraying pesticides. Um, uh, he hasn't got any protective clothing. He should be wearing a, a mask and gloves and, and boots. He hasn't even got shoes on this guy. Um, and he has no idea about the properties of the chemical he's spraying. Um, in fact, he's spraying something called paraquat which is a type of herbicide, which has been banned in Europe for many decades because it's incredibly poisonous to, uh, to people. He only has to swallow a drop of this and it'll kill him. Um, uh, and what's really sad um, is that uh, paraquat is manufactured in Europe. In fact, most of it is manufactured in England in the town of Huddersfield. So we banned it for sale to it in Europe because it's too dangerous, but we're happy to manufacture it and sell thousands of tons into the third world for poor guys like this who doesn't know any better to, to run the risk of poisoning himself. Uh, I think that seems that's very hypocritical to me. Okay, I'll skip that one because I don't want to overrun. Uh, enough doom and gloom, what can we do about this? Uh, so the, there is no good news, thankfully. Um, uh, lots of environmental issues uh, are very doom and gloom. You feel pretty helpless in the face of climate change and so on. And it doesn't feel that things we do really make much obvious difference. But with insect declines, because they live all around us, um, uh, they're, they're in our parks and gardens and so on, uh, we can all get involved in looking after them. Um, and most insects haven't gone extinct yet, unlike the poor giant earwig. Um, and they can recover really fast if we just provide them with food and somewhere to nest and so on. It's pretty simple. Uh, so we can all get involved and feel empowered by, by looking out for, for insects. Um, so what do we need to do to look out for insects better than we have so far? Um, well, there's, there's sort of four rough areas encapsulated by these four photographs. I'll start top left. Um, we, we could invite insects in to live in our gardens, in our urban areas. We can make them more wildlife friendly. And I'm going to talk more about that. Um, we need to think about farming, those big monocultures. Is that really the only way to feed the world or is there a better way? I, I think there are many better ways, actually, far more sustainable ways of food production. But that's for another day. I haven't got time to dwell. Um, we need to put back more flowers into the landscape. Uh, bottom right there is an example of a beautiful flower rich um, hay meadow. Uh, Europe used to have vast tracts of this kind of habitat cut for hay once or twice a year. Um, uh, in, beautiful uh, flower and insect rich habitat, uh, but it was almost all lost in, um, 
in the 20th century. In Britain, uh, we uh, had about 3 million hectares of this habitat in 1930. Um, by the 1980s, we destroyed 97% of it. Pretty much all of it went in 50 years, uh, which is really sad. And it had a big impact on, on all the, the different creatures that lived in that habitat. But we can restore it. And um, there are some, some brilliant meadow restoration project, projects going on around Europe. Um, uh, and, and they can be very successful. So we, we, you know, we can fix it. And then bottom left, we need to stop using poisons, particularly in our gardens. And I'll come back briefly to that. So gardens and urban areas. Um, I think this is a, a subject with, with huge potential. I don't know how many gardens there are in Sweden, but in the UK, we have about 22 million private gardens covering an area of 400,000 hectares. It's a bigger area than, than all of our nature reserves. Um, and just imagine they were mostly insect friendly, uh, wildlife friendly, full of wildflowers and pesticide free and, and so on. Um, and even better, imagine we could get the local councils on board so that the, the road verges and the roundabouts were also full of flowers. Um, maybe city parks, um, cemeteries, any other urban green space that we can we can um, influence. That would make a, a, a network of insect friendly habitats stretching across Europe potentially, which would be absolutely brilliant. And the exciting thing for me is that this is already happening, that there are um, great examples. There are lots of people um, who've already made their gardens wildlife friendly. Uh, it's, it's, it's become very popular, very trendy at the moment. Um, and so this is already happening. It's not just a crazy pipe dream of people like me. Um, I think urban rewilding, if you like, is, is, is a real growth movement and that's great. I get quite excited about this. I've written books about it, as, as was mentioned at the beginning. I won't plug my books any further. Um, I thought it was worth flagging up that gardens really can be incredibly diverse. Um, and there's no better illustration of that than, um, than, than this garden. Um, so this is the garden of Jenny Owen, who was a lady who, who lived in the UK. Uh, she lived in the city of Leicester. Um, and she had a small garden and nothing particularly special in terms of size. Um, but she, remarkably, she spent 35 years cataloging every plant and animal species she could find in her little garden. Um, and her, her grand total after 35 years was 2,673 different species of, of, of creature, um, of which 1,997 were different types of insect. So, I mean, I think that's amazing that a garden can have two and a half thousand different species living in it. It's extraordinary. And all of our gardens could be like that with just a few little tweaks. Um, so what do we need to do to make our gardens more, more insect friendly? Well, we need to grow the right kinds of flowers and there's lots of advice out there on, on that. Um, generally speaking, old fashioned cottage garden plants tend to be good, herbs tend to be good. I've made lots of YouTube videos. Um, should you be interested, check them out. We'll give you guidance on what you might grow in your garden. And most of the species that thrive in the UK are good for Sweden too. Um, one thing that's emerged from a number of scientific studies is that um, uh, wildflowers, native wildflowers, tend on average, with exceptions, to be better for uh, attracting insects to their flowers than the non-native species. Um, and also they provide uh, often they provide food plants for the caterpillars or uh, the offspring of other types of herbivorous insects. So they're supporting native wildlife in multiple ways, which non-native plants don't tend to do. Um, so we should encourage native wildflowers in our garden, which brings me on fairly neatly to top left, the subject of weeds. Um, it's, it's a strange thing, but we've, we're taught from an early age that there are certain plants um, that are undesirable, that are, um, that, that are weeds, that if you're a bad gardener, if you have 
dandelions or, or ragwort or thistles in your in your garden. Um, but these are native wildflowers. They're, I think, um, rather beautiful and pollinators certainly like them. Dandelions, for example, are a really fantastic nectar resource for uh, pollinators in early spring. Uh, things like hungry bumblebee queens that have just come out of hibernation. Um, uh, so it would be great if we could persuade people to be a little more tolerant of these uh, native wildflowers. And uh, it may sound a bit silly, but you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden, just like that, by just renaming them all wildflowers. Um, okay, moving around clockwise, uh, flowering trees. I'd love it if we grew more flowering trees in our gardens and, and in parks and streets and so on, um, particularly fruit trees, um, which produce this beautiful blossom in the spring. Uh, things like apples, cherries, quince, pears, plums, and so on. Um, I've got about 50 fruit trees in my garden. I'm lucky, I've got about a hectare of garden. And I've managed to get varieties that flower really early in March, right through to um, trees that flower in June, which provides this continuity of forage, of flowers for pollinators through, through most of the spring. Um, and they really appreciate it. And of course they return the favor by um, uh, uh, ensuring the the flowers set fruit and I get I get my own zero food miles, uh, apples and so on in the autumn, which is brilliant, winds all round. But why don't we plant apple trees or fruit trees in city parks so that people can just go and help themselves? That surely that's a really sustainable way to use the space, providing food for pollinators and food for people. Okay, moving around. Lawns, I'm sure, oh, sorry. Um, I'm sure you're, um, uh, you've, come across this, it's, it's a, a Europe-wide campaign these days that, to try and reduce mowing. Um, and it really is a simple thing that we, anyone who has a lawn can do. Um, that, this there is my lawn. Um, and I haven't planted any flowers in it. It's just, uh, just what comes up if you, um, if you don't mow. Uh, most most lawns have all sorts of flowers in them that never get the chance to, to flower because many people mow every two weeks. Uh, they're burning fuel, they're wasting their time in my view. Um, so if, if we could persuade people to just be a bit more relaxed about mowing and instead of trying to recreate a, a sort of Wimbledon tennis court in their garden, um, instead go for a slightly longer shaggier look with color and flowers and insects. You know, ne next time you get the urge to get the mower out of the shed, if instead you can restrain yourself and get a deck chair and make yourself a coffee or a gin and tonic and, uh, and sit down and enjoy the, the flowers and the wildlife. And of course, it's not, uh, it's not just our gardens that are mown. Um, the local councils very commonly mow road verges, roundabouts, all sorts of amenity grasslands. Um, commonly but mown eight, ten times a year uh, at huge expense to, to the local authority um, and not necessarily, yeah, it doesn't need to be like that. So bottom left here is a, what was a boring road verge which has now been transformed into a, a beautiful wildflower strip. Uh, wouldn't it be great if every road verge in Europe, every roundabout was covered in flowers like that? Uh, that would really make a difference. Instead, what we see commonly in many European countries is this kind of thing, um, which makes me really angry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so to, top, I don't know whether this happens in Sweden. I, I suspect it does. Uh, apologies if this is not relevant to you. It's relevant to many countries around the world. Um, so top right there, um, uh, there was a, it's a tree, a silver birch tree in English. Um, it had a little bit of vegetation growing around it. It was probably just grass. It's hard to tell now um, because obviously it's dead. Um, somebody has sprayed it with herbicide. Um, in fact, it's very common for uh, local councils um, all around Europe to employ uh, teams of people who, who literally drive the streets uh, looking for anything green and killing it. Um, 
and that just seems completely mad to me. Well, what is the logic? Why is that necessary? Does this look better, dead? Um, I don't think so. I think it looks awful. It seems like just crazy sort of environmental vandalism to me. Um, uh, and what's more, the chemical being used is it's called Roundup. Uh, the active ingredient is glyphosate. It's pretty clear evidence that it's a, it's a carcinogen. It's a, the manufacturers dispute this, um, but some prominent court cases have found in favour of plaintiffs, people who've argued in court that their cancer was caused by occupational exposure to glyphosate. So those people driving around spraying the bases of trees like this risk catching cancer from doing it. And what's more in the middle and left here, um, we spray this, this carcinogenic chemical on the play equipment in children's play areas, which just seems completely bonkers to me. Why on earth would we do that? Personally, I would ban pesticides from urban areas completely. Uh, I don't think we need them in our gardens at all. And I don't think the local council needs them to spray the streets. Um, and if you think that sounds quite radical, well, um, uh, France have already done this. They did it in 2018. They introduced a law that you can only um, buy a pesticide if you're a licensed farmer. Um, so the local councils can't buy them. The gardeners can't buy them. Um, and I, I think that's brilliant. And as, so far as I've heard, you know, France is still standing. Paris hasn't been overrun with giant dandelions and killer cockroaches or anything else. They're managing perfectly well without these chemicals. Um, and I, I think all of us could manage perfectly well without them. Whatever we do, uh, we, we need to take a, uh, do a better job of looking after this amazing thing. We, we don't often stop to think about it, but we live on a rock hurtling through space with a crust of life clinging to its surface, mostly different types of, of insects. It, it's our home. It provides us with everything. Um, you know, there, it's a cliche, but there really is no planet B. Uh, and it seems to me terribly sad that we're being so reckless with the, our fellow travelers on, on this planet. Um, and it really worries me that, that our kids are going to inherit an impoverished world um, and their lives will be harder because of it. Um, and I always think it's, it's so strange that we would all do anything for our children apart from leave them a decent planet to live on, uh, apparently. Uh, so let's do better. And what better place to start than by looking after uh, the, the little creatures, the insects that live all around us. Thank you uh, so much for bearing with me. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, I thought that was really inspiring. And I wonder if there are any questions from the audience here. The, while uh, they are wondering uh, about what to ask, I, I can uh, have a question. Uh, I wonder if you have any good tips for reaching out to your local council, for example, uh, because these uh, sterile lawns that you showed, they are definitely a problem here where I live, for example. So I wonder how, what's the smart way to reach out and say, hey, could we, could we change this? Could we set up a nice uh, meadow patch, for example? Yeah, I, I mean, councils usually do listen if, if you know, if, if they can see that there's um, clear support for this from multiple members of the local community, they'll, they'll usually do it. Um, they probably don't even question the mowing. It's just what they've always done. Um, but if you could put together a, a, you know, a, a letter and get a whole bunch of local residents to sign it and deliver it to the council saying, you know, please, we, can, can we have a wildflower meadow in the local park or can you reduce the mowing of the road verges or whatever then? Uh, and also point out that, of course, it saves them money as well, which is an attractive option. Um, then most, most councils are, are willing to at least uh, consider the idea. Um, th there may be a backlash, and this is an, part of one problem we need to overcome, is that, of course, there are still people that, that complain if they see the grass hasn't been cut. They think it's laziness. They don't realise it's an active choice uh, that, and it's helping biodiversity. They just think the council isn't doing its job and they're, they're used to things looking moan because uh, they've always been moans and, and people are kind of creatures of habit, aren't they? 
Um, but if if the pressure for wildflowers and reduced mowing exceeds the number of people complaining, then the council will usually do it. Thank you. Sounds great. I might try that. There is a question here. Uh, do you hear me, Dave? Yeah, can hear you fine. Yeah. Hi, Dave. I'm Mats. I work for the Foundation Nordens Ark. I just had the lecture before you here and uh, a common theme that you also touch upon is the use of uh, uh, the method to sow wildflowers right to improve the the local flora and uh, i would really like to know how's the discussion on the origin of the seeds how far away can or should you take or not take the origin of the seeds from a genetical point of view. How's the discussion yeah. in, in the UK on that? There, there is a lot of discussion, sometimes rather heated discussion, um, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, that in the UK, there is a charity called Plant Life um, who really champion reduced mowing and so on. But they're very, very keen on local provenance, on seeds coming from ideally uh, yeah, uh, just a kilometre or two of, of the site you're trying to restore. It's difficult though because uh, obviously it's, there's a trade-off there. If you're if you're too insistent on very local provenance, then often there isn't a source of seeds, and that then becomes a big obstacle to sowing wildflowers. Um, so a, a degree of compromise, I guess, is usually required. Uh, one thing that uh, that does I am um, put my back up considerably is that um, you sometimes see mixes being sown um, which which have don't even have aren't even 100% native plants um, uh, sometimes in the UK for example people will sell what they call wildflower seed mixes which contain North American annuals um, I don't know whether this is a thing in Sweden but uh, I, I think that's really naughty um, uh, and uh, shouldn't shouldn't be allowed. If it says wildflower on the packet, I think by implication that means native wildflower. Um, but yes, it's a tricky one. Uh, there aren't enough suppliers of local provenance seed to, to satisfy the demand at the moment. Yeah, that thanks is, a lot. That is very much an issue here as well. Um, are there any more questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Ken Danielson here from the Botanical Garden. I uh, may connect a little to Matt's question. Uh, we have a, a youth project here that we call So Vilda, So Wild. And it's inspired by British uh, in initiatives before that. And uh, I think it's a great loss to not have you still in the EU. Uh, especially now in the situation where we, at the re regional regional level here in the in the in the west, have a project that we try to reach out to other European countries, and uh, the issue is to um, bring forth ideas of uh, biodiversity and not the least than making new meadows and of course it's important that we try to find the local produced seeds but it's hard we realize that but inspiration you can always have from abroad or from any any country and i hope there is hope to get uh, you british involved in such uh, cooperation between european countries in bringing forth Growing meadows. Do you have any any uh, things that may give me hope on that? Uh, I, um, I, all I would say, I guess, is that um, we we may sadly uh, have left the European Union, but uh, the United Kingdom is still in Europe geographically. We we aren't <laughs> just going to sail away to to join America or whatever. Um, and, you know, the, 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 we'd be very keen, I'm sure, I would certainly be very keen to, to collaborate. And I don't think not being part of the European Union 
really has to prevent that. Um, and it's it's great to to you know that there, there are so many different initiatives going on around Europe with a similar kind of theme, and we need to learn from each other as much as we possibly can. Um, so uh, hopefully we can still collaborate. Uh, any more questions? Yes, Jenny. I have a question as well. Uh, Jenny is my name, also from Botaniska. Um, I just wondered now when you have published this latest book, Silent Earth, what is your next project? Uh, my next project is a, is a bit of a quirky one. It's a kind of children's encyclopedia of insects, which uh, um, um, is what I'm working on right now. It's going to be illustrated with lots of paintings. Um, not that I'm not doing the paintings, I should hasten to add, it would be awful if I tried that, but uh, I'm providing the words. Uh, and, and obviously, I think I've all, always been very um, keen to, to engage with kids and capture them at that, you know, when they have that enthusiasm for, for bugs and somehow try to, to keep it going. Um, and I hope in a small way this new project might might help do that. That's perfect. You're you're really reaching out to all corners of the general public. <laughs> it's really nice to hear. Uh, if if I may, I would like to have one more question. I do wonder if you see um, any change in attitudes towards what's aesthetically pleasing and acceptable in our uh, more or less uh, uh, urban landscapes and uh, gardens. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think there's been a huge sort of sea change in attitude, um, particularly um, stimulated by the, the COVID lockdowns um, uh, and the, the enforced lack of mowing of many road verges. And the, in that first, the first lockdown two, year, two and a bit years ago, there were so many people on social media to, posting pictures of beautiful wildflowers, orchids and all sorts of other things that they that had sprung up in places that where they'd never been seen before, um, simply because they weren't being mowed all the time. Um, and a lot of councils have con in, in the UK have continued not mowing, um, having learned their lesson from the COVID lockdown. And I think, you know, that many more members of the public now understand that, that you know, what those what a wildflower meadow is um, and realize that that um, mowing isn't the only option for for managing amenity grasslands uh, so it has changed but there's still a long way to go and it was, it was an educational job to be done to bring more people on board because there are still people that complain um, and I, I think you know making it clear like signage is really important. If, you, if, a, if a council is gonna leave an area uncut, putting a little sign up saying wildflower area makes all the difference. Maybe cutting a path through the middle of it so that it looks managed rather than abandoned. Um, that, that helps to win people over. Uh, we've still got a way to go, but it really has changed in the last, uh, last three years, I'd say. That's really brilliant uh, to hear. Thank you. And uh, if you were here on site, we would hand in a little gift to you. But uh, since you are not, we were thinking of posting a little publication to you about um, our botanical garden here. So thank you very much for presenting today. Sorry. Um, oh, one uh, more I, question, actually. Uh, sorry, Dave. I would like to ask you one question, and that is more... Uh, not uh, regarding private garden owners, but do you have any advice to people who are living on farming, what they could do or how we could uh, more take this political um, stand, how to avoid um, uh, killing the small farmers more way or putting them into, into the industry as industry workers? Yeah, crikey, that's a that's a very big topic to try and tackle right, right at the end here. Um, I, I firmly believe that the current ap approach has been a disaster. That the um, Europe wide and and much of it funded by the common agricultural policy in in most of Europe, um, this move towards a, a, a focus on maximizing production at all costs which we've had for the last, uh, well, really since the Second World War, um, uh, has, has been disastrous for biodiversity. And it's not sustainable. 
Uh, it's resulted in, in a, a huge decrease in the number of people involved in farming. The farm sizes have massively expanded. Chemical inputs go up year after year. Um, it, it's damaging the soil. It's wiping out biodiversity. It's, it's wiping out the pollinators that it depends upon. Um, and it's a big contributor to, to greenhouse gases. So I think industrialized farming, I really hope, um, as, uh, will come to an end before too long, but I'm perhaps being optimistic. There are alternatives. I mean, there are um, some really fantastic examples of small scale sustainable farms that I've come across in the UK. I don't know any in Sweden. Um, focused on fruit and vegetable production sale to local communities through a farm shop or a veggie box scheme um, many of them organic um, uh, there's even a biodynamic uh, farm that i visited many times i don't know if you have biodynamic farms in sweden but it's really inspiring some of what they do is a bit sort of witchcrafty uh, but but basically they look after the soil they look after biodiversity um, they seem to produce a lot of crops from a small area of land and they employ lots of people uh, there, there are alternatives. We don't have to continue down this route, um, but it's such a big topic. I haven't really got time to, to, to go into it properly. Well, thank you for answering this uh, last question once again. And um, uh, we hope to keep in touch and we'll keep an eye on your uh, upcoming projects. And we wish you all the best with your future work and uh, especially the outreach work, which I think is so uh, critical in the times that we're experiencing now. Thank, Thank you very you. much again.